and action. Good evening. My name is Kai Bird. I'm the executive director of the Leon Levy Center for Biography at CUNY, City University of New York. Why? <laughs> well, it just turned off. What did you do? I'm not sure what's happened here. Testing from my side. That well, sounds like All right. okay. All right, let's see if our sound is any better. Yes. Am I echoing? A little bit. A little bit. A little bit. Now, where is that coming from? Let me. Uh... Hold on, folks. Let's try to solve this, this technical Kai, problem. Does anyone else in your house have their computer on? Tune to this? Not tune to this. No. <laughs> I like it. Are you kidding? Tune to this? <laughs> Maybe your Try again, Kai. Okay. So we're going to try again. I hear a slight echo, but I'm going to try to ignore it. Um, this is the Leon Levy Center for Biography, and as you all you all know, we are very nice to promote the art and craft of biography by talking to biographers about their new books. Um, this these events are sponsored by the Leon Levy. Uh, foundation and Shelby White, who has generously been funding this program for oh, almost 13 years now. Um, our next event is this Thursday, September 17th, with David Nassau, the uh, uh, professor emeritus at CUNY, and Peter Beinhart to discuss David Nassau's new book, The Last Million, which actually was just reviewed in the New York Times today. But tonight I'm delighted to be in conversation myself with the great Rick Perlstein to talk about his new book, Reaganland. Uh, I have the bound galleys of it here. It's a fantastic, as you can see, an over a thousand page tome. Um, Rick is uh, just an extraordinary historian this is the fourth in a series. The first was called Before the Storm, Barry Goldwater and the Unmaking of the American Consensus. The second volume came out um, a few years later, Nixon Land, The Rise of a President and the Fracturing of America. The third, The Invisible Bridge, The Fall of Nixon and the Rise of Reagan. And now comes the fourth and final installment, Reagan Land. America's Right Turn, 1976 to 1980, which covers the presidency of Jimmy Carter and his defeat by Ronald Reagan and the New Right. Rick, your work is just, you know, formidable, um, both in substance and in length. Um, the test for me of a big volume like this always is sort of the, the random flip and you go and you start reading just randomly a paragraph here and there. And uh, you pass the test. It's, you know, fabulous. It's just great stories, uh, personalities. It's not, you know, exactly a biography completely. It's a sort of new kind of biography where you meld your focus on one prominent individual like Reagan or Carter or Goldwater or Nixon, and you mesh it with all this anthropology and uh, everything from you know the politics to what's going on in film culture that resonates with the politics, um, to books, to TV, to you know the culture wars. Uh, so it's it's very anthropological in that way and fascinating stuff always. So I, I want to sort of begin with a few questions about your process. How do you do this? Um, you know, biographers generally, like myself, I'm working 
finishing a biography of Jimmy Carter as we speak. Um, you know, we write chronologically um, and from the archives and interviews and, and, you know, some people have detailed outlines, others kind of wing it organically writing from the material at hand. Um, how, how, what's your process? Well, you got to un unmute yourself. I'm not muted. Can you hear me? I didn't. Oh, darn. Uh, you can't hear me. Okay. I. Okay. Yes. I see it. Okay. All right. Can you hear me now? I'm good. You know what this reminds me of is in my first chapter, I write about this absolutely astonishing incident when the first televised debate since the 1960 Nixon Kennedy debate, uh, the whole nation tunes in and they tune in for like 40 minutes and then suddenly the sound drops out and uh, <laughs> Carter and Ford are, are um, just waxworks dummies just standing there for a half an hour while text running around and it's a, of course in my book it's an allegory right it's an allegory for what Jimmy Carter uh, is trying to appeal to the country with saying everything's going wrong right Gerald Ford is saying I've restored America to normalcy and here um, the nation that put a man on the moon can't even you know do a nationwide t television hookup which I guess can be a segue into your question uh, the whole idea of anthropology Anthropology, I think, in a lot of ways was my favorite subject in college and then in graduate school, even though I knew my subject would be America and the United States. Uh, the method of trying to construct um, the rules by which an entire society tries to live together has always been my fascination. Uh, and if you read an ethnography, uh, which is the word for an, a monograph of anthropological knowledge about a society, you know, everything fits, right? It'll talk about the economy of the culture. It'll talk about the culture. It'll talk about the politics, right? Because everything does fit together because people do not live politics in isolation from culture. People do not live culture in isolation from economics. I guess you might say my method is sort of like there's a Renaissance sculpture who has a block of marble and he you know, sees the figure inside the marble. But a, as a historian, you have to assemble the block of marble first. You create this giant pile of information, whether it's information about elections, the TV shows that people were watching, the movies that people were watching, the newspapers that they were reading. And what I tried to collect is what an ordinary, um, relatively aware citizen would be coming across in their daily life. And, you know, you talk about presidential biography, uh, even though we put the presidents on the cover because there is a certain marketing advantage to that. Um, when I wrote the preface to my second book, Nixon Land, which covers the years from 1965 to 1972, I said the subject of the book was not Richard Nixon. It was the ordinary citizen who voted for Lyndon Johnson on election day in 1964 because to vote for his opponent, Barry Goldwater, seemed insane. And that same individual voting for Richard Nixon eight years later, 1972, because to vote for the Democrat, George McGovern, seemed insane to court chaos. So it's really a portrait of a political culture. Uh, and anything that contributes to that is, is not foreign to this method. Now you're... This okay. I can't hear you. <laughs> Can you hear me? How do you keep track of all the research? How do you know when to tell which story? Um, I think you, you used the word organic, and I think that's a, that's a good word. I usually have, uh, for my books, 10 or 11 files that are thematic. Uh, one of them might be uh, Reagan, of course. One might be Carter. Uh, one might be uh, political economy or economics. 
uh, one might be race. And I just type and type and type and type. I'm an obsessive typer. One of the best decisions I made when I was beginning this process in 1997 was to take notes on everything and anything that flashed through my mind to put down on the computer. So um, the notes are millions of words. And I think with my fingers. I think it's a very bodily process. When I'm studying a speech, I'll type out lots of the speech because I feel like that kind of um, um, that imbricates the text kind of into my body, into myself, into my being. And um, I, one of the things that makes this possible and much easier is the, the find function on the computer. Like as long as you spell something reasonably correct, and I use some kind of hashtags, um, you can put anything in any file and eventually find it pretty quickly. So there's a lot of cross-referencing, something that will be in one file will be in another file. Um, but let's say Ronald Reagan you know, gives a speech in which he makes a reference to the Equal Rights Amendment. That'll obviously go in the part about the Equal Rights Amendment. That'll go in the part about Ronald Reagan. I might have a section on Ronald Reagan's rhetoric, his style, right? And then once I'll do a lot of writing as I go along, I have kind of a hashtag that indicates here's a sentence that I might put into uh, interpret this later in the book. So there's lots of um, dribs and drabs that exist in these massive files. Um, so it's not only just kind of finding the, uh, getting my chisel and finding what's inside, but it's also an additive process. Um, I'm very profligate in my methods. Uh, and um, I don't think they could be necessarily reproduced by anyone. They're very personal to me. Um, but the proof is in the pudding, it seems to work. So how long did this, this volume take? Six years. So I, I conceived of this project in 1997, uh, late 1996. And really, I should say, you say that this is unique. Uh, my method is unique. Actually, my role model for this was Taylor Branch's Martin Luther King books. So uh -huh. there, the series is called America and the King Years. And reading the second book in that series really provided me a, a rough outline of the kind of book I wanted to write, in which obviously Martin Luther King is in the center. But he does have wonderful stuff about the Republican convention. You know, he does have stuff exactly, about yeah. uh, how banal TV was at the time. Um, so I thought of three books. And eventually, like The Sorcerer's Apprentice became four books, as I realized that the book that was supposed to cover 1973 to 1980 uh, metastasized into two. I see a little smile on your end. You know how it works. Uh, the density kind of feels natural to me. So once I got to, you know, 19, get, get, was getting towards 1976 and realized that I was, you know, uh, reaching the terminus of what a book could reasonably be, I realized that it had to be two books. But I pretty much finished the one after the other. You know how Trollope supposedly started his last novel, his next novel on the, the last page of his previous one, right? That's sort of what I do. Although, of course, well, they're, they're, they should stand independently. So it took about that you mentioned Taylor Branch. I remember talking to him a couple of years ago, and, and he denied that he was a biographer. <laughs> Do you it's think of your I was, Yeah, I was on a panel, a biography panel once, and I said I was a biography skeptic. Uh, people's lives do not seem capacious enough for the anthropological project I have in mind. Um, one, I can't say that this guy's an influence because I was doing this book by the time I um, stumbled across this book, but James McGregor Burns' book, Leadership, uh, writes about how in a democracy leaders get chosen and are elevated. And he says kind of like the psychic drives of the leader uh, match the psychic drives that are kind of careening around the culture at any given time. So, for example, in the case of Richard Nixon, this schema that's in the book in which, you know, he wasn't able to get into the fraternity in college, so he started his own fraternity made up of the people who couldn't get into the fraternity, right, which becomes the template of the silent majority and his weaponization of the resentment of white middle class people who felt kind of left out of the party uh, felt condescended to by the cool kids, right? So um, it's about them, right? And the reason that they are able to grasp Richard Nixon because he's articulating their anxieties, their aspirations. And in the same way, in The Invisible Bridge, of which you might say this is the sequel, 
uh, I talk about how Ronald Reagan's optimism, quote unquote, you know, his ability to blithely project, you know, confidence uh, in the face of what anyone else would reasonably call chaos, you know, comes to match the mood of a country in which no one was raised to uh, contemplate the possibility that America could fall apart, that we could lose a war, that our president could be revealed as uh, a mafia don. Right, so here's Ronald Reagan uh, saying that the Watergate burglars were not criminals at heart, that Richard Nixon uh, didn't do anything that all Democrats don't do, and his insistence in the face of all his political advisors' advice um, to denounce Richard Nixon, um, always insisting that nothing is wrong, that Richard Nixon didn't do anything wrong. And the dominant discourse in the mainstream media, the mainstream political media, which in all my books tends to be the villain of every one, uh, is that Ronald Reagan doesn't have a chance of having a political career after his gubernatorial career unless he accedes to reality and denounces Richard Nixon. But it turns out that millions and millions of the people in the nation are desperate for this kind of absolution, that their, their criminals, are, their, their leaders that they chose are not crooks, that with Richard Nixon, their conception that their neighbors um, are um, a threat to their existential comfort uh, is their feeling and Nixon's feeling at all, uh, Nixon's feeling too, such that they choose Richard Nixon, not necessarily in spite of Watergate, but in some sense because of it, because of the mood that he's expressing that we see every day on Fox News, that uh, these liberal elites um, are out to um, destroy the white middle class, the suburbs, uh, and then Richard Nixon is defending us. Ronald Reagan does it in a different way. So stop there and, and go back to in the mid-1990s when you were casting about for landing on a project like this. Why, why what was the motivation for your passion to try to understand conservative America, rising conservative America. I mean, in the 90s, we were living at, uh, with Bill Clinton, who had uh, apparently redeemed the Democratic Party. And here you come along and decide, no, it's time to look at the conservative roots of what, what was the origins of that? What in your childhood or in your graduate work or in your background, what made you so curious about the anthropology of a rising conservative tide? Very much a question that is answered in my um, therapist's notes, notes over the years. <laughs> okay. Oh, and oh. now we have no echo on my end. That's wonderful. Thank you to the text. Uh, roughly speaking, I was born in 1969, and the first editor I had for my first book, Paul Eli of Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux, actually made a very, very astute observation that people tend to be most fascinated in the time right before they were born, the time that formed their parents. And my obsession growing up in the 1980s uh, was the 60s. I mean, the melodrama of the 60s, and I'm certainly not alone in this among my generation. The idea that new possibilities for human existence seemed to be a borning every day, revolution after revolution after revolution, the sheer drama of it, the violence, the passion, was just so, so much more interesting than the everyday political experience I was living in the 1980s. And I was obsessed with the 60s. I tell this story many times growing up in Milwaukee. Then oh, I got, when I got my license, driver's license when I was 16, I was not you know, running around with my buddies. I was going to the Renaissance bookstore in Milwaukee and getting strange volumes in which America was spelled with KKK in the middle and uh, people were you know, talking about revolution, and I was reading Time Magazine down in the basement. And so that really is the foundation of it. The anthropological angle is, uh, I was always fascinated by the TV preachers that I see on Sunday mornings, 
and this idea that there's this entire massive population of Americans who have this exotic way of seeing the world that's completely different from my own. And then, of course, there's the element of kind of growing up as a liberal and trying to figure out why people think differently, why these conservatives think differently. And this was most, um, this became kind of a life's project right around 1994. I was living in New York, working at Lingua Franca magazine, and Newt Gingrich's revolutionaries take over Congress, talking about countercultural McGovernix. And again, the white middle class, you know, being under the most profound threat. I didn't feel like I was under the profound, most profound threat. My parents didn't appear to be under the profound threat, but this seemed to be, you know, a source of great passion. And then the next year, the bombing of the federal building in Oklahoma City by Timothy McVeigh fascinated me. I wrote a lot about that. So again, the idea of in completely incommensurate visions of the world and political culture unfolding before me. And I, when, I, when I was looking for a book project, I began to realize that the 1960s had been interpreted as uh, a story about the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement and these movements for reform, but really what it was was a domestic civil war, short of, short of shooting in most instances. But I realized that narrating the civil war could be a project. And I'll tell one more story. Um, when I was young and adolescent and I was obsessed with the 60s and fascinated by the 60s, I figured my parents must have some interesting stories to tell about the 1960s. Uh, my dad was born in 1937, my mom in 1943, so I asked, asked them what the 60s was like. And my mom told me a story, just like I asked, and the story was that there was a riot going on in Milwaukee where I grew up, and they couldn't go into the city to work at their businesses. So they invited all their friends over for a pool party. And I realized that the people who are retreating behind their white picket fences, uh, to whom all this stuff I found so exciting and romantic and thrilling was in fact a threat, needed their history to be told. So that kind of creates a whole new narrative about the 1960s. And this, the part of the history that hadn't been told, the kind of niche that existed for me, was the rise of the right who, after all, by the time I was growing up, had, had won. Ronald Reagan was president. Right. So it turns out it was a very timely project, uh, uh, very relevant to our present times uh, in the time of Trump. Let me make one, make one quick, quick, more, quick point. more point. Um, another thing that was happening at the time I was writing in the late 1990s was that much as the Goldwater movement was seeking to turn the Republican Party into an ideological vehicle, the Republican Party had become this readout of moderation, there were a lot of people like me on the left who saw the Clinton administration as this readout of moderation, just this pale imitation of what the Republicans were doing. So one of the exciting things when my first book came out on Barry Goldwater uh, when, when that came out, one of the exciting things was people who wanted to nominate Howard Dean for the president in, 19, in 2004 and orient the Democrats around opposition to the Iraq war took up before the storm as kind of a handbook. So that was another element, this idea to have a more ideological politics in the Democratic Party. Yeah, well, timely again. But... Um... So that leads me to ask, why are there only going to be four volumes? Why not a fifth volume <laughs> on... Down, Kai. Down, Kai. <laughs> huh? I have other ambitions to stare down. down. <laughs> I mean, by the time it gets to the 80s, it's my life, right? I mean, uh, as you've noticed, each one, you know, waxes bigger with each volume. I think uh, uh, if I wrote a book about, you know, 1983, you know, maybe that would be a thousand pages in itself. I mean, I have no critical distance, but I really want to, um, I have a giant project in my next uh, with another kind of massive canvas. So uh, I feel like, I feel complete. I feel like I've, I've done it. I've, I've accomplished what I wanted to accomplish back in 1997. I'm sorry, what's, what's the next big canvas? Industrialism. Uh, I'm a big uh, I'm a fan big... of Karl Polanyi's The Great Transformation. 
and it's a theoretical book about how non-market societies become market societies. And the big kind of sinosure in that history is the decade of the 1830s. And all over the world, um, non-market societies are enduring what Polanyi and, and me understand to be the trauma of traditional ways of life being subsumed to um, monetary and market-based ways of life, whether it's the Trail of Tears or the Chartist movement or the famine, famine. in Japan. So it's going to be a book about the 1830s. Wow, a whole another century. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, so let's let's talk a little bit about Jimmy Carter, who is very central to this book. Um, liberals were, you know, always frustrated by Carter and perplexed. They couldn't figure him out. Traditional liberals, tr traditional New Deal, you know, FDR, JFK liberals. Uh, Carter didn't, you know, fit in neatly into any of those boxes. But he he was obviously, well, I don't know, would you call him a, a liberal, a populist, a Teddy Roosevelt, good government progressive, or just a Southern fiscal conservative? <laughs> All the above. Uh, I, would, I, would, I would dispute that liberals were perplexed by him always. I think certainly in the wake of what he considered his greatest political accomplishment, the Florida 1976 primary in which he um, defeated George McGovern, he was, he was hailed as a liberal sa savior. You know, uh, folks up here in New York uh, were like, this is the guy, this is the guy who can um, reach the people that, we that, that, that Hillary Clinton called the deplorables, right? And revive and restore um, the New Deal project. That was a precipitate judgment on their part. Um, Jimmy Carter, I, I don't know how you judge it, but his 1976 campaign was an astonishingly brilliant political project. Of course, this is the guy who went to his mom and was it 1973 or 1974 or maybe even 1972 when all these presidential candidates were visiting him in the governor's mansion and he realized that they didn't seem to know anything more than he did. And he said, I'm running for president. And Ms. Lillian said, president of what? You know, maybe the Plains Chamber of Commerce, right? Um, so he comes from nowhere, quite literally an asterisk, and he begins knocking on doors at farm stands in Iowa and runs away with the 1976 nomination. But he does so, I think, um, being extremely cagey about where it is he precisely stands on most issues. Um, it becomes very plain within a, a few months that his greatest ideological passion is indeed the notion that Americans you know, need to learn to make do with less, uh, that uh, austerity uh, is uh, a moral and political imperative. I mean, this is a guy, as you know, who um, grows up on a farm where his dad is not unprosperous, but they're making their own, you know, molasses and, you know, hiding, tanning their own leather. And he's whatever. How old is he when he started walking five miles, five miles in the town in to the... sell boiled peanuts and earning enough money to, you know, buy investment properties, right? Um, six years um, old. Yeah, six. Yeah, six. Uh, goes off to college goes and he, he owns three or four houses that oh. he's renting. So... I think there's a lot of things going on with Jimmy Carter. I think, for example, his absolute commitment to the Equal Rights Amendment, his, um, his commitment as a post-racist Southerner, right, which is a big part of why he seems so exciting to liberals in 1976. But yeah, I mean, I think a figure like uh, Burt Lance, his bigger friend who's hired to kind of uh, balance the budget, is the keynote, the fact that he's committed to economic austerity. And I consider this um, a tragedy in a lot of ways. I mean, by the time he's president and within a few years, of course, inflation is rampant within the context of American politics. It's 10%, right? It gets even higher, which is unlike anything we've seen since World War II. It's, it's not necessarily such a 
terrible thing that things cost 10% more than they did a year earlier. Uh, but it's perceived as a terrible thing. But somehow our economy has rocketed out of control. And his response to that is the conservative Republican response, is that we need to retrench our budgets. And the reason I say that's tragic is because, of course, now we have virtually no inflation, uh, 1 2 percent most years, but we have a massive budget deficit. So this was incorrect. So he uh, introduces into democratic politics this idea of retrenchment, this idea of, of austerity. At the same time, Republicans are making their appeal to the nation that the way to heal the economy is to put money in people's pockets by offering across the board tax cuts. So Republicans for generations said, no one shoots Santa Claus. We can't win elections because the Democrats just give people money. Now it was the Republicans who give people money. And then there's the accompanying story of in 1979, in which he nominates Paul Volcker uh, as the, um, the uh, Federal Reserve Chair. Um, and he knows that you know, he's in office to tighten the money supply to basically induce a recession which was one of the few promises, in my judgment, that he made in 1976, that he wouldn't induce a recession to uh, control inflation. And as Robert Solo, the, the MIT economist who won the Nobel Prize at the time, said um, Paul Volcker's monetarist policy, which he got from Milton Friedman, was like burning down a house to roast a pig, that it would only deliver a small decrease in prices very far in the future, and that's exactly what happened? So he goes into uh, the 1980 presidential election with 20% interest rates, being blamed for it because he refuses to distance himself from Paul Volcker. And to put a, put a punctuation mark on it, he doesn't get political or moral credit from it, from the gatekeeping elites, the media. Uh, if you watch the 1980 debate, one of the moderators says, why haven't you asked Americans to sacrifice? In the same way that he says in 1978 in his um, State of the Union address that government can't do anything, it can't cure inflation, it can't fight poverty, all this stuff, Bill Clinton has to say the exact same thing in 1996, right? Barack Obama has to say the same thing. Um, America, uh, the Democrats are still seen as the party of economic profligacy. So I think that's the core of Jimmy Carter's entailment as a politician. And I think that that's one of the main reasons uh, the white working class abandoned him in droves for Ronald Reagan in 1980. Of course, Ronald Reagan was offering a fraud, but it was a convincing fraud. Yeah, no, he's, uh, that's why I say he's very confusing. I mean, I find him just really complex in that he's very liberal on social issues. He comes in, he's a radical consumer advocate. He appoints all these Ralph Naderites. Um, you know, he does all sorts of things like mandating safety belts for cars and airbags. And uh, and yet he's a small town fiscal conservative. That's his instinct with when grappling with stagflation. And you've described his response brilliantly. But you also, I think at one point in your book, in your description, you point out, and I think this is really on the mark, that Carter's favorite theologian, was Reinhold Niebuhr. And you write, quote, the president's taste for Niebuhrian moral complexity was one of the things that made him, Carter, so ideologically ambiguous. Not an easy thing to be in a culture clamoring for more and more easy solutions in confusing times. And I, that, I think, is, you know, captures the Carter's personal political dilemma. <laughs> this, is, this is who he was. From Ronald, from Ronald Reagan. Reagan. Could it be possibly more different from Ronald Reagan? And that comes in the book, of course, in the, it, after I discuss the movie Star Wars and talk about how, you know, the, 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 the nation was hungering for Manichaean black and white answers to the, the country's problems where there were none to be had. Carter offers instead austerity, complexity, gray answers. He goes up to the mountain, Camp David, for this 10-day retreat that seems very weird and where he engages in self-criticism and comes down from the mountain and talks about 
you know, the uh, narcissistic culture we have. He's he's preaching to America that we need to realize there's an age of limits. <laughs> it's of his, of his character, in my judgment, a lot of this is taken from our friend Rick Hertzberg, is that he was an engineer and he was a preacher, right? And the preacher obviously ex exhortatory, right? And knows the truth and is going to bring the truth and is going to call people to their higher angels. But at the same time, he's an engineer, right? Uh, he sees everything as a machine to tinker with and not a politician, right? So here's this guy who... Um, you know, will do something like read the Army Corps of Engineers plan for the future and say these are the dam projects, the water projects that don't offer bang for the buck to the American people. And he'll just um, just completely uh, unilaterally announce that he's going to kill 50 dam projects, completely oblivious to the fact that those 50 dam projects are the lifeblood of 50 politicians. Uh, uh, and, you know, are you, you blaming you are are you blaming Carter for Reagan? Are you blaming Jimmy Carter for Reagan? No, I, no I, I'm, 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 I'm not a historian that seeks blame. You know, I'm. I like to think that I'm, 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 I'm standing apart from that sort of that sort of moral judgment. Um, I mean, yeah, I, I, I blame Jimmy Carter for Ronald Reagan the same way I blame Richard Nixon and Gerald Ford for Carter and Lyndon Johnson for Nixon. I mean, the dialectic rolls on, right? Um, but um, I but, mean, um, is I think he's certainly a way. certainly a, a Reagan. A Reagan. But, but of course, of course, he posed political he posed opportunities political for the Republican Party and a Republican field in 1980 that was universally conservative, except for John Anderson, right? Right. So um, let me switch this topic a little bit now to let's talk about the South. You know, Carter won the South in 1976 as a Southerner, and then all those Southerners turned their backs on him in 1980. So the key to was the key to Reagan's victory, the South. Was it all about the ascendancy of Reagan through the South or and therefore, was it all about racism? Well, of well, course, he won such an electoral landslide that, you know, um, had it been a close election, I think the shift uh, in the South obviously would have been, you know, that would have been the tipping point. I wrote about this in an essay that appears in uh, the website of Smithsonian Magazine. I call it um, Southern Strategy 2.0. And... Um, I don't, I wouldn't attribute it to racism. I would attribute it to uh, the switch of, you know, evangelical Christians, which, you know, racism and make America white again is certainly a component, right? Um, but, um, you know, don't forget that Ronald Reagan is such a skilled politician that he wins the endorsement of uh, a Ralph Abernathy, you know, Martin Luther King's right-hand man, right? Uh, he wins the endorsement of, Gene McCarthy, right? Uh, and, you know, Jimmy Carter, of course, is not without his uh, ventures into um, racial demagoguery. And, you know, in the Pennsylvania primary in 1976, he says people want ethnic purity in their neighborhoods. You know, in, uh, in, in um, was it 1976 or 1980? He, yes, 1980, he, he uh, campaigned with John Stennis in Mississippi. And the reporter says, this is John Stennis, you know, uh, a lifetime segregationist. And Jimmy Carter says, oh, well, I don't think so. And then John Stennis says, says, well, I haven't voted for a civil rights bill in my entire life, right? So I think it's, that one is not as clear, right? But um, the extent to which the notion of introducing into American political life um, evangelical, evangelical Christians as a voting bloc uh, turns out to be a poison chalice for Jimmy Carter. And the reason is he's a very old-fashioned Southern Baptist this is a denomination that sees staying aloof from uh, political issues as um, after the Scopes trial is pretty much their, their raison d'etre. You know, they believe in Romans, keep your eye on things above, you know, not on things of this world. But as the social revolutions of the 1960s kind of work their way into the mainstream, gay rights, feminism, um, sort of cultural liberalism, what, what, what 
Paul Weyrich, the new right theorist, calls the, the Achilles heel of the Democratic Party, sex. Um, more and more, um, people with traditional mores um, weaponize uh, their rage at um, something like gay rights. Don't forget that the preachers and the Anita Ryans of the world who led these anti-gay rights initiatives in, in, in cities like Miami and Eugene, Oregon and California in 1978, their argument was that gay men were recruiting children, right? They couldn't reproduce, so they were recruiting. It was, it was a QAnon-style conspiracy theory. It was a classic moral panic. And Jimmy Carter falls afoul of that because of, again, his general decency. Uh, he was a little ambivalent about gay rights, but when he had a chance, he 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 did not take the opportunity to 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 be a demagogue against gay rights. Um, so the real shift is in evangelical Christians, which of course are preponderant in the South. Uh, then of course there's the little bagatelle with which I begin the book, which is Ronald Reagan sits on his hands rather than campaigns for Gerald Ford. So he loses Texas, so he loses Mississippi, and those alone would have been enough electoral votes to give the Republicans the victory in 1976. Right. So you also devote quite a bit in your narrative to how the press covered Reagan badly and how they covered Carter sort of mockingly all the time with derision and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of Sally Quinn's stories in the Washington Post. I'm thinking of the killer rabbit story that blew up and sort of made a mockery of Carter in a ludicrous way. So, you know, as you said, mentioned earlier, the press is a big target in your book. You are, you're, you're almost a press critic in, in, for pages at times. So let's talk about the role of the press in this. Many of the routines, the routines about how the press kind of screws things up in all my books are as present in our national life as they ever were. You know, uh, I end before the storm with the press saying, since Lyndon Johnson won a landslide, um, trying to uh, organize a political party around backlash to civil rights and liberalism is suicide, where they don't notice that that same day in 1964 in California, an anti-open uh, housing, open housing civil rights initiative loses by a million votes, right? They, they, they project consensus where none exists, right? After uh, 1977 in the book, they're talking about how America only has a one and a half party system because the Republicans won't purge the conservatives, right? And then in 1980, um, you know, uh, the New York Times publishes 50 stories on, on Billy Gate right? The, the fact that Jimmy Carter's embarrassing brother Billy took, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars from the Libyans, a terrorist sponsoring state of Libya, it had nothing to do with Jimmy Carter. He was completely innocent. Um, but this was a post-Watergate, uh, post woodward and Bernstein press that was kind of desperate to kind of, you know, put another pelt on the wall. At the same time as, you know, Ronald Reagan had, you know, um, a defense advisor, uh, who later became his national security advisor, Richard Allen, who immediately had to resign once he was national security advisor because he was you know, up to his neck in corruption. Barely any articles about that at all. I write about how um, Mother Jones did a uh, expose of Richard Allen showing he was on the payroll of all these kind of semi-fascist colonial countries, and they distributed hundreds of copies to the media at the, at the, at the Republican convention. They couldn't get a single bite. This idea that the, the, the media bends over backwards to appear fair and not to evidence liberal bias uh, is an enormous reason for Jimmy Carter's defeat. And the fact that he you know, simultaneously is offering uh, a message of austerity as he gets no credit for that message of austerity. Um, I think their record is terrible in this election in 1980 uh, and, and most elections because it's a very cliquish group who uh, only talk to each other. So a um, couple more questions and then we'll go to open it up to the audience to Q&A. But, um, you know, as a biographer, I, I, I look at your portrait of Reagan and he still seems like an empty vessel. I mean, it's still 
he's just this movie actor who spouts the lines. He's memorized his note cards. He's, he's, uh, I guess, astute on stage, but you know, the flesh and blood of the man doesn't really explain anything. And so the, you come away from your book thinking that really, and I guess this is your message as a anthropologist, is that what really explains Reagan is the culture wars. And is, is the American, the American longing, longing for innocence, right? And that's what he's offering in spades. I think the mistake of a lot of Reagan biographers is this idea that they're going to find some uh, flesh and blood Reagan uh, underneath the shell of, you know, kind of optimism and blindness. Uh, we, I think all of us know that we're not going to find, you know, sort of a flesh and blood Trump uh, beneath, you know, sort of the neurotic shell that, you know, Mary Trump has adumbrated so well. I mean, as an adult child of an alcoholic, he was a guy for whom, you know, forming this, um, this hard shell of denial of chaos um, became the core, right? I mean, uh, I think um, Karen Horne, the psychoanalysis, uh, gives the best account of how people form identity formations in which, you know, they're so protected from the snares of contradiction and when you're in Hollywood, you can get away with that. When you're in what Mary Trump very um, movingly calls an institution, an institutional context, the White House, you can get away with that. And the person who knew him best, who studied him her whole, you know, most of her adult life, Nancy Reagan, said she couldn't even get beyond the shell sometimes. So that's you so got to realize that the shell is the person, and that's what people were attracted to. The shell is the person. So this makes me ask you, what what did you think of Edmund Morris's biography of Reagan, Dutch? It was a scandal. Was a scandal. Uh, I mean, by creating you know a character named Edmund Morris, he completely um, distanced himself from responsibility for what he said about all the people in the book, right? So there's... There's a, there's a point in the book where, quote unquote, Edmund Morris in quotation marks calls James Baldwin a frail little frag or a frog voiced little fag, right? Did Edmund Morris believe that or could he kind of like, you know, uh, distance himself from that opinion because it was only, quote, Edmund Morris in quotation marks, right? Uh, I think it's a profound failure of the imagination. And the fact that there's a wonderful book um, called Red Plenty by a, by a um, novelist called Francis Spooford, which is a kind of a historical novel about uh, the Khrushchev era in the Soviet Union. And it's also a fictionalized um, account of actual events. But in the footnotes, he explains which parts are fictional and which part are real. Um, um, Edmund Morris did something much more uh, immoral. He actually had fiction in the footnotes such that, for example, he from a, got wonderful interviews from a writer named Ralph Kays that I used in my last book, too, with uh, Ronald Reagan's classmates from Eureka College. He took these interviews in 1966. And the exact same division between people who found Ronald Reagan a hero that they would follow anywhere and a, and a phony that you know, had uh, no inner core was present in 1966 among people who knew him when he was in college, right? But in Edmund Morris's hands, you don't know if these people are real or if they're, 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 they're fictional. Um, so, I mean, it's, it, it should be pulped. It's nonsense. Well, it's still, I think, in many ways, the best sort of conventional biography of Reagan in terms of his actual personal, despite all the, 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 the phony footnotes. It's just, I can't hear you. He could have he could done have it in a way that retrieved, retrieved his honor if he just would have said in the footnotes what he made up and what he didn't. Then it would have been a, possibly a great book. I agree. So uh, let's see, one last question. I, I saw recently that this week Newt Gingrich attacked you, you know, on Twitter. <laughs> so how is the, the conservative movement taking this book? What is their well, reaction well, been? I think that having written two books about Ronald Reagan in which I say uh, the gift that Ronald Reagan kind of delivered to Americans was to absolve them from any examination of hard questions and hard choices. Uh, and that, you know, he kind of lets people think about their leaders like a little child 
thinks about their mommy or daddy, I mean, one sees that enacted in the defenses of Ronald Reagan. Uh, so, I mean, I think that uh, in r important respects, um, the people who are fawning over Donald Trump are um, basically forfeiting their right to be taken seriously in just about any subject. Uh, and, you know, um, so um, devil take the hindmost. So let's um, get to some of the questions from our audience. We have over 200 people here registered. Um, Greg Miller of the Washington Post notes that the CIA was running a Swiss company, Crypto AG, from 1970 until 2018 that sold the cipher equipment that revealed Libya's bribe to Lib Billy Carter. Was Robert Vesco involved? He took over the Swiss company. <laughs> it was involved, well, in fact. Uh, one of the interesting things about the, so people of a certain age, except for me, <laughs> don't know who Robert Vesco was. He was a financier who um, basically built his company and uh, he was called the fugitive financier in all the newspapers. And he delivered a massive bribe to Richard Nixon in a suitcase of $100,000. So it was a little part of Watergate to try and be able to come back to the United States. But um, Robert Vesco was involved in you know, brokering the kind of things that Libya was doing with, um, with Billy Carter. The fascinating thing about it was um, Robert Vesco was all over this kind of um, butter email style coverage of Billy Carter and Jimmy Carter in 1980. At the same time as um, Robert uh, uh, Allen, the 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 Reagan um, uh, the Reagan National Security Advisor, was actually uh, in cahoots with Fesco at the same time, and you never saw that. So that's a really good um, case study in the failure of uh, the media in the 1980 campaign. Little little well, a little in the, in the a little in the woods, yeah. Um, a bit off of conservatism, says this questioner, but how do you think Carter fits into the stream of new Democrats and ultimately the emergence of Clinton? It's very it's, interesting. He, I think in a lot of ways, he's the, um, he is an early adapter of what became associated with new Democrats. Um, of course, a lot of what new Democrats were also up to were kind of turning their back on sort of civil rights and uh, minority rights, gay rights stuff that the, the Democrats involved were involved in. And as we said, Jimmy Carter was not all, all about that. But I think that the emergence of the new Democrats speaks to um, the perplex that Jimmy Carter gets no credit for that, right? The, car, the, 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 the party twice nominates um, someone who's turning their back on the New Deal, and yet kind of these elite actors, uh, their response is, well, why won't the Democrats turn their back on the New Deal, right? So another person asks, can you discuss your piece for the New York Times Magazine, quote, I thought I understood the American right, Trump proved me wrong, where you talk about how liberal historians tend to be too nice about talking about the more violent history of conservative politics. So this is a piece I published in 2017, and what it spoke to was, in my first book, how I um, kind of accepted as gospel the, the right's kind of representation of itself, that before the American right could, you know, enter primetime American politics, they had to kind of purge uh, the fringe, the ultra-conservatives, the racists, the anti-Semites, um, but that the emergence of Donald Trump, and not just the emergence of Donald Trump, but their, his embrace, right? His embrace by, you know, 90% of Republicans, you know, most self-identified conservatives overwhelmingly, most conservative Republican electoral officials with, you know, exceptions that you can count on one hand, suggests that this strain, uh, supposedly purged by William F. Buckley in the 1950s and 1960s, in fact, has always been, uh, you know, a crucial part of their coalition in much more complex ways than we reckoned. Uh, in this book, uh, the way um, that insight plays itself out is the fact that um, the Ku Klux Klan was a big factor 
in the years that I'm writing about. Uh, I might not have even thought to include that because didn't, you know, William F. Buckley purge the Ku Klux Klan from the conservative movement. But lo and behold, uh, in, you know, uh, dear, in, in, in the industrial suburbs of Michigan, you know, a Republican uh, Ku Klux Klan member wins the Republican nomination uh, and does 16 points better than the last Republican had done in 1978. And his you know, campaign message is, you know, scratch a Republican and you get a Klansman, just like you scratch a Democrat, you get a communist. Now, I'm not saying that's true, but I'm saying that um, that sort of feral kind of uh, open racism um, is something that you cannot discount from the story of the rise of the conservative coalition in 1980. Uh, another question sort of about the process, how have contemporary sociopolitical events influenced the writing of these books? Has it gotten easier to write these books? What were some of the main challenges? It's easier, it's easier because, because I have because lots I have of practice, lots of right? I, one of the reasons I'm done with this series is I kind of feel like I've kind of mastered the process and it's not a challenge anymore. But they're all written under the sign of the time when they're written, right? Because why write about you know uh, a historical contemporary a historical phenomenon that informs the present present without explaining the present in some way, right? So I mean I think before the storm very much was written uh, with this question of how does an ideological faction succeed or not succeed in you know kind of taking over a political party at a sa the same time as you know like I say um, uh, ideological liberals and leftists were felt like they were. Uh, disenfranchised from, you know, the new Democrat, Bill Clinton, moderate Democratic Party. Uh, you know, Nixon land was written during the era of George Bush in which, you know, uh, the weaponization of white middle class resentments, you know, vis-a-vis so-called cultural elites uh, was, you know, just absolutely saturating, you know, Republican politicians. Uh, the Invisible Bridge was written during the Obama uh, era in which, you know, the question of whether America could be mature or not. You know, Barack Obama was also a Niburian and kind of uh, saw a, a nation that would not kind of uh, uh, rise to the level of kind of this moral complexity uh, and the ordeal and the challenge of that, which obviously, once again, as with Jimmy Carter, sort of um, both succeeds and fails, shall we say. Uh, and then, of course, this, this book being written during the uh, era of um, Donald Trump, one of the things I like to say is I don't want anyone to read this, be able to read this book without considering it a baffling confusion that so-called Christians could be embracing Donald Trump. Like I say, the, 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 the TV preachers who were um, a cornerstone of the Reagan coalition, um, they were people like Jerry Falwell who were saying, you know, a homosexual will just as soon kill you as look at you. You know, um, they were um, basically weaponizing eliminationist rage towards people who are different from them uh, in a way that's um, just as savage and vicious as anything we hear uh, on the alt-right today. So on, along that lines, here's a question from someone who's asking, please talk about Reagan's indifference to the AIDS crisis and the similarities to the current presidents in response to COVID. It's going to be about C. Everett Koop and uh, how he actually came from the Christian right. He was a pro-life activist and he became the Surgeon General, but it took him a year to get um, confirmed because he was so controversial and so far right. But when he faced an epidemic and a pan, uh, in the form of AIDS, he did the heroic thing and he just listened to scientists and he listened to activists and he insisted on coming out with a... Um, national strategy with no interference from the White House. He demanded that as a condition of, of, of taking on the job. And he came out with uh, a pamphlet that was sent to every American, every American household, which said uh, sex education should start as early as possible, even among children. He said, you know, he, he used the words like condom. He used words like unprotected sex. And, um, um, Compare that to you know our discourse around you know the White House and 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 masks today. So he basically got around the reluctance of the next the rest of the White House to actually confront the reality of what was happening scientifically. So yes, it's true 
that um, Ronald Reagan refused to mention the word AIDS until there were you know tens of thousands of deaths. And uh, in fact, when C. Everett Cooper Coop, uh, took his heroic action, um, it basically caused a civil war within the White House, led by William Bennett, um, who said, you know, basically telling people, you know, not to have sex outside of marriage was the only strategy that people should have. So this is definitely a strain within the conservative Republican coalition, uh, but it's uh, it can be transcended by the sort of astringent, heroic uh, action that we see from too few in the Republican Party today. All right. So uh, here's another question. Why did Carter, why did Jimmy Carter tell poor Americans to go without gas instead of ending price and wage controls? Um, <laughs> he never said that. Price and wage controls. He never. He, he was being urged by some people to uh, natural, natural gas, gas, but actually, but actually it was he his. Uh, he he moved heaven and earth to try to end them. So that's just 180 degrees around from the truth. The liberals, the liberals wanted, to keep, wanted to keep. Yeah, natural, natural gas, gas and natural petroleum. petroleum. But Jimmy Carter fought them. Uh, as you, as you know. Let's see. I'm looking for any other possible questions so, oh after reagan cut taxes this questioner says he ended up raising them how did he explain his switch oh, oh that's well, very that's simple. simple i mean, I mean uh, 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 ronald reagan ran on a promise uh to cut income taxes 30 percent across the board he didn't quite get that but was able to institute a massive tax cut with the cooperation, by the way, of a lot of Democrats like like um, like Dan Rostenkowski, the head of the Ways and Means Committee, and it caused fiscal chaos, and he had to raise them again um, because he did not have Fox News and he did not have Republican dominance in Congress, and he had to accede to reality, um, which you know uh, was. Um, it's important to understand that Dem the, the politicians do not leaders executives do not choose you know, policy, policy options out of a catalog and just institute them, right? They work in, in, in contexts that are given to them. So that you know, when, when you know, Richard Nixon you know, sounds rhetorically like an environmentalist and you know, um, signs a, a law that you know, advances environmental aims, uh, he's not doing that because he's an environmentalist, he's doing that because that's a political rally, reality. And that you know, once he won his 1972 landslide of 49 states, he instituted a budget that was exactly like the kind of uh, budget that Ronald Reagan would institute, right? So in the same way, when he was governor, um, he in fact, in fact passed several tax increases for exactly the same reason. And in fact, uh, left the state with a very massive surplus which allowed Proposition 13 to pass and not have any particularly dire effects for a couple of years. Um, and um, Ronald Reagan was someone who um, understood that uh, a half loaf was better than a full loaf. And even though he never really kind of trimmed his sails rhetorically, he was willing to make the kind of compromises that were necessary to you know, govern the country because he really felt like he didn't have any choice. So here's the final question, sort of following up on that theme. Reagan, as a conservative, does he have a does does the Republican Party have a future uh, as Reagan conservatives, or has Trump completely hijacked the party and taken it off the rails? So that you know, after Trump, are we going to see a party that goes back to its Reagan? It's celebration of Reagan. Donald Trump, Donald Trump responds to um, is asked to respond to why he said uh, privately that COVID was the deadliest disease we have ever seen when he said publicly that it wasn't deadly at all. And his response was, I have to be a cheerleader for the country. That's Donald Trump being a Reagan conservative. That's this idea of blithe optimism as the official uh, ideology of the nation. You know, uh, when Donald Trump uh, tries to outlaw um, the teaching of, quote-unquote, critical race theory 
in any program paid for by federal money because um, America is cannot be cannot acknowledge the idea that it has a racist history. That's Reagan conservatism. This idea that America is always God's chosen nation and can do no wrong unless it's kind of um, you know uh, unless except for the um, influence of malign outside forces, right? So that is an entailment of Reagan conservatism to which Trump is a very close um, inheritor. There's a lot of elements of Donald Trump that turn its back on a lot of things that Ronald Reagan believed. For example, Ronald Reagan was a passionate defender and advocate of, of immigration. And in fact, in the 1980 Texas primary, George H.W. Bush and Ronald Reagan competed with each other uh, to see who could be the most welcoming to undocumented Mexican immigrants. But then, you know, when the politics, you know, kind of the political, the political realities hit him, he actually backtracked on that sure, during the campaign. Like I said, he was a political figure who was, you know, not set in stone on any particular issue. Um, so, you know, I mean, my last word has to be something I like to say in all my interviews, and, and that's that history is this the study of continuity and change. And um, there's nothing in Donald Trump's rise that is not foretold by the previous history of the right wing takeover of the Republican Party at the same time as, um, you know, he represents a, a transformation of uh, right wing politics at the center of power, right? Uh, that a lot of the kind of feral, vicious, violent, rageful extremism uh, had been kind of kept out of uh, the citadels of the Oval Office, except when it was just being visited upon, you know, people designated foreign enemies of the United States, of course. So, I mean, I, we have to understand this in a very nuanced way. Uh, but the idea that Donald Trump represents a, a retreat from the Reagan legacy is um, at best oversimplified. Well, on that note, I think we are way over seven o'clock and I want to thank you, Rick, for really an interesting conversation. It's a great book. Everyone should try to go out and get it. It's not that long <laughs> and uh, you learn a lot, a lot of history, a lot of culture. And uh, if you're at all interested in the 70s, it brings back a lot of memories. Anyway, thank you, Rick. It's been terrific. Namaste.